We take a single episode of a science fiction TV series and overanalyze it to within an inch of its life. This is the Fusion Patrol Podcast. Welcome to the discussion. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fusion Patrol. It's been a long, long road, but we have finally come to the final episode of the classic 1960s series, The Prisoner. I'm Eugene. And I'm Simon. And tonight uh, we are going to be talking about the, 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 the final, the, the classic, the, the conclusion of the series that has, that has gripped us along the way. Um, and as always, we start out with a summary, but I'm not actually going to summarize it this time. I'm just going to make a couple of basic comments. Um, since the beginning of The Prisoner, we have followed the exploits of Number Six, a man who finds himself in a community not of his own choosing. Why is he there? Who runs the place? What do they really want from him? Why is it so important? With each twist and turn, the puzzle has become both clearer and murkier. But in this final episode, Fallout... It is simply 50 minutes of the answers being spelled out clearly in black and white for all to see. In a series that's been at times a bit obscure, the finale clubs the viewer over the head with its clarity of vision. In this episode, our hero number six meets number one face to face and defeats him. Or does he join him? Well, I think we've mentioned before, um, Simon, that you have not seen the series uh, previously. And... Um, didn't know what was coming so i'll i'll give you the what did you, what did you think well yeah, I, it all makes sense now everything suddenly is is clear <laughs> <clears throat> this this is a, a well a, an often t- talked about episode of the prisoner uh for its um uh, you know you either love it or you hate it uh, or, or maybe there's a position in between. I, I'm not a fan of the episode, I have to say. You, you wanted it all to stay unexplained? <laughs> I don't, I don't know what I wanted from it, but, but as we've discussed, uh, in the past, I think some of the episodes like Free For All, where it's, it's gone a little too far towards the, uh, beat you over the head sort of surrealistic worldview i haven't been as crazy about and and this one really does actually kind of carry that um uh i well i'm not sure i entirely agree i my criticism of free for all was that some of the allegorical elements within it were when when you say beat you over the head they were making very very blunt points really i thought you know they were they were using the 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 kind of situation of the village the the furniture within it to clearly kind of map some aspect of the democratic process that was corrupt or unsatisfactory and say hey look at this and and point a finger and make fun at it and part of the problem was that it didn't there wasn't a there wasn't a coherent ideological underpinning to it in this uh, i'm not i'm not sure you could say that it's taking any particular aspect or there's a kind of obvious direct uh allegorical element to any particular part of it and say what exactly it's mocking or trying to make a point about or can you i could take a stab at it um you know and and, and in in my quote unquote synopsis i uh, i am being a little bit uh, facetious there in about it spelling it all out in black and white uh i could see how somebody could come away from this you, you could come away from this episode going well that was very profound and my guess is that after 36 straight hours of writing patrick mcgowan came away from writing this script going that is really profound man um <laughs> But uh, on, on the other hand, you could come away you mean from he this. Wrote it, he wrote it in one shot. Yes. Well, without sleeping. I don't know. It doesn't say whether he slept or not. But uh, so if he slept, then that's even less than thirty-six hours. Um, and I think it. I think it shows um, that perhaps it could have used a polish in, in in some ways. But also, there were a lot of people who came out of this episode thinking it was incomprehensible gibberish. And, uh, and in fact, the ATV switchboard was lit up so much that, and 
I can't 100% prove that this isn't apocryphal, but it is reported in many cases. Patrick McGowan had to escape the country after this aired. He left the UK. In case they put him in prison. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in case maybe somebody knew where he lived, because they were getting a lot of irate calls at uh, ATV. They they had to uh, they had they to issue... They knew a, where he lived. The butler would protect him. There you go. They had to uh, uh, issue a press release uh, explaining the episode. Uh, or, or giving some explanation, uh, and, and ATV's explanation is, by the way, quote, the village, quote, symbolized the prison that is man's own mind. Does that sound like a fair assessment of what we, what we watched? Um, if it is, I would probably say Patrick McGowan had definitely escaped it. <laughs> um, does that make sense? Does that make sense? I, I don't, I don't know. See what I mean? I, I do feel like there is some profound ideas that are being thrown around in this episode, but I don't know that the package works. I think we could, uh, we could take that view that, um, really number 48 and number two are representing stages in a life again. So kind of carrying on the theme from the last episode. Um, these, these are the stages of rebellion that, that man goes through. Youth is always rebellious. Although well, I wasn't really actually quite rebellious. But anyway, and then middle age crisis is what you could take for uh, number two. You reach a point where you're not satisfied with what life has handed you and carry on. And then so what's number six? Self-identity again, that theme, true to yourself. I don't know, because he, he's not, I mean, he's not an old man. Non-conformity. Stubborn bloody well, mindedness. Yes. There's there there are those there are those there are certainly those themes. But he's not an old man, so in a way Well, so the others could be considered conformists. So youth you're you you live in your you're in conformity. Um the old man you're in conformity and, and you re <clears throat> all right, when I say youth is in conformity, I mean childhood you're in conformity. And you reach youth that is a a break from your prior behavior pattern. Number two conformity and then the break from the pattern number six never a conformist that's why his revolt is true and pure and and pristine or whatever the words were the president used to to describe him and i'm stretching i'm stretching I don't know, to get be, that yeah i the, number 48 it it's a very uncontrolled kind of rebellion there's no there's no sense of uh there there being any real direction to it He's running around, he's singing, screaming. Number two, it was, I mean, as you say, there was, there was a conformity there. It's, it's a kind of last dis ditch desperation, if you like. Mm -hmm. a, a kind of regret at all the conformity, I suppose, and, and breaking away at the end. Number six, the thing that has always stood out, really, and, and comes from that very controlled performance of, of McGowan is that very deliberate nature, that consistent nature of, and, and thoughtful, um, thoughtful adherence to what he considers to be, I guess, his, his principles or his view of the way that he should act as an individual. And that run, that runs against conforming. So in a sense, it is an act of rebellion, but it's a, it, it, it's not a wild act of rebellion. Does that make sense? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, steady. It's not, yes, it, and it's not, it's only huge. It's only big and it only matters because of its consistency. No particular aspect of it is that much of a threat on its own, but it's just the strength of his dedication and commitment to his own individuality that, that is the problem that, you know, because it cannot be overcome because the village never managed to to crush him. So so let's say that number one, who is, would you can we do we agree that number one was revealed to be number six, or did that mean something else? Um, but if you, you mean who, who, what was behind the mask? Yes, it didn't look like number six to me. Was it number six? Yeah. Yeah, it was McGowan. It was McGowan. Mm -hmm. Even in that shot through the, the hatchway closing. Yes. Because I freeze framed that. They were using a funny lens, I think, to, to distort that. But it yeah. It really didn't look like his face. 
It it was supposed to be Magoon, yeah. I mean, it was Magoon. I, I, I mean, it felt like it, it, it was intended to be because it felt like there needed to be a big reveal there, but it didn't look like him and they didn't leave the camera on it. But, but yeah, okay. That, that's the okay. brilliance of Patrick Magoon's acting, that he can make himself into a wild man and look different, I guess. Maybe we should, we should credit, credit that as uh, good acting. But yeah, it is, it is Magoon. Um, so, I mean, we, we are talking about he is standing trial basically before himself um so he has but been he, he's not standing trial uh, i kind of get the impression that he's third up even even though they're talking about inauguration maybe maybe he's already been convicted uh it it's hard okay, it's really well, hard I to mean, tell this is this is why i was saying the kind of that the, there isn't there isn't an obvious target to uh to to, to the kind of um there are obviously certain symbols and practices and ceremonial things that have been kind of plucked out from our our society. So thing, things like the uh, assembly <laughs> being a little bit like a council or a parliament of some sort. And then you've obviously got a judge in the wig, which comes from, from the justice system, if you like. Mm -hmm. And you have number six himself, or whatever we must call him now, planted on a on a throne mm -hmm. but it's such a mishmash that's the thing because you've got all of the all of these different there's 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 no way you would you would bring all of those things together unless that's supposed to represent society itself it certainly didn't seem to me clear that it was representing a court because it was only the judge that you know would be associated with the court the other bits would not be anything to do with the justice system mm -hmm. Mm, okay, um, I can see that. Um, I can see that. I have always thought that there was, there is the scene where the anarchists get up and read out um, the charges against number two, non-conforming with society, which of course is a, is a, a, so, a joke so, into so itself. It's the anarchists that are reading the charges about being against society and conformity and order. Okay. 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 So I'm I'm uh, I, I'm kind of trying to keep up with my thoughts here. Then, but if, if 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 the choice to bring symbols of different aspects of society together there are significant in some way, is that perhaps because what's what's going on here is not not a trial per se, it but it is a judgment in the sense of society's judgment. Yeah, I think that's kids, fair. If you like, you you won't tolerate that society won't tolerate anarchy because there's all that Hobbesian stuff, isn't there, about needing to have, but, but, you know, this is why they need number six because they need to have some kind of leader. It doesn't matter how good or bad the leader is, but without the state, then life will be nasty, brutish, and short. Mm -hmm. So, it, so it is rather than it being a trial, it's society's judgments and the judgments are necessary because they are what they are the judgments that society needs to make on individuals or on individuality or whatever in order to function as a society i think that's maybe. i think yet another facet of the of the strange uh, conglomeration that is the final episode um i mean i'll I tell you what i really uh, what i really thought when i finished watching it <laughs> Which is basically this. I, I, it, it kind of felt to me like they filmed the rap party <laughs> instead of, instead of actually making an episode. They just going, oh, well, you know, it, it's a, it, it, it's been a fun series to make. Let's have a bit of a knees up <laughs> <laughs> as they're dancing down the motorway and, uh, you know, destroying bits of the, bits of the set. And, you know, again, it is, it is very, theatrical and they they get back certain uh, actors who have appeared in the show quite memorably previously mm -hmm. and so in a sense that has a kind of, that has a bit of a party feel to it and they make something that is basically the closest the prisoner gets to doing a musical episode yum yum with all the all the all the kind of singing and and dance routines how the hell are they they have um one of the Beatles numbers. I've made All you need is love. Yeah. All you need is love. Thank you. The Beatles. I have an answer have to Beatles this. I know what your question is going to be. My question is, 
I watch this on iTunes, right? Yeah. And and you've got a DVD or a Blu-ray yep. of it. And is it is it on there? Yep. How do they afford the royalties to okay. release that? I, I I actually have an answer to this. They bought them out completely for that song. What? Yep. It's one of the very few Beatles songs in very few theatrical productions that they bought a non-royalty buyout. They can use it without having to um, pay royalties uh, forever in any medium. Good God. McGowan is some kind of wizard or <laughs> sage. Yeah. What a genius. He didn't want what to confidence. use that, I think. Um uh, there was something about him not wanting to use necessarily that and and the sound man or the music guy said now this music is this music will be timeless and uh so cuz he thought it would date the episode by using it <laughs> and um <laughs> to be fair well, the beatles have have lived past the sell by date of uh, many other bands from that era and the song all you need is love really is fits um, the slaughter with machine guns at the end. Um, uh, that, to, that was, that seemed to me extraordinary as well that the Beatles allowed that. I mean, I, we mentioned in a previous episode the fact we were, we were talking about, um, choreographed fight sequences that are accompanied by classical music. Mm hmm. Because this was done in a previous episode and I couldn't think of any, anywhere earlier it had been done. But it's done, been done a number of times since. And so it's, it's a kind of curiosity of, oh, is this, is this when the ground was broken? The, the machine gun fight with all you need is love over it. That was shocking. I, I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> and, and it, it really did, it really did surprise me that this, the song was allowed to be used in that way. But, you know, in terms of the dissonance that created, it's a fantastic sequence. You have to wonder if John Lennon would have seen it that way. And in a way, I, I kind of think he might. I'm, I might, I actually kind of think he might see the, the dissonance there as being a, a, a meaningful expression and not degrading the song. Yes. Um, yes, true. I, Paul McCartney, I don't know, but, but John Lennon was a lot more, um, cynical, I guess, maybe would be my, my take on it. You know, there's sort of the positive and the negative personalities there, and and John Lennon seemed a lot more grounded in reality. So uh, yes, and 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 I guess the Beatles did did uh, dabble a little in surrealism themselves. So oh yeah, they might have been sympathetic to the project from that perspective. They dabbled in surrealism in their real lives, <laughs> <laughs> chemically, I think. Um, so I, 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 you know, because it just really isn't. I mean, there really isn't a story there to me. So I'll ask questions. Was it a trap? In other words, was this another village plot that they were executing against him up okay, until the well, point where he got the, the machine guns and started cutting people down? Well, actually, aren't there two questions there? Because one question is that question with up to the point as the rider that you, you added. The other question is, was it a trap? Full stop. Has he left the prison? The door and says he that. hasn't. The the door. Yeah. The butlers when they get to the house and the butler the door opens and it's got yeah. the So that yeah, which suggests that the whole thing is a trap. Or or possibly just that because people from the village refurbished his house, they used a little bit of their village door shutting technology in the refurbishment. That would be nice know. of them. It would be nice of them, but then, you know, they didn't have to clean his windows and all that, so Whatever. Well, it makes it um, easier for the cameras to see uh, see through them. <laughs> yeah, true. I, I, it, I don't see. I mean, it could have been a trap. Obviously, it it, it could have been a trap because uh, these these stories thrive on that kind of ambiguity. But it's not clear to me how the trap would have worked, unless it was straight that they wanted him to be their leader, as that as they said. In other words, it was. Not, not so much a, them being duplicitous as them saying exactly what they meant. What about the, um, what about the orbit chambers in the rocket? Orbits 48 and orbit 2 they had. Well, I don't know what, what, so the whole rocket thing, I mean, 
I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. In a way, um, any question you ask, <laughs> and this is this is the thing. The, the prisoner has been chugging through sixteen previous episodes, raising questions, and so episode seventeen has the baggage with it of expecting to deliver some answers. So you can go through your questions and you can ask your your questions. But but it doesn't it doesn't seem to me that this episode actually answers anything at all, except in giving you lots of possible answers. Because maybe he does escape, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe doesn't have to cross he, the water or anything. The escape it the escape. Well, there, there are new questions associated with that there, but but so maybe maybe the escape is uh, as it appears to be. Maybe as we've just alluded to, it is all all of it another trap and so that he will believe he's left the village when he hasn't left the village and in that way he will completely remain a prisoner because he will no longer have any concept of escaping there are the other questions um that we've had through the series about what was the village for was it uh, was it set up by the british secret service in order for agents who were too valuable to to let loose um, could be kind of farmed, as it were, in in uh, in a sort of almost happy retirement, or was it run by the opposition uh, in order to uh, park agents who they needed to uh, extract information from, or and the, the, you know this has come up a few times. Was it this this new world concept, which is where this rocket comes in? I mean, presumably that's that's the idea with the rocket. That's that's the question that's not being answered there. Oh, but it's kind like of an exodus. a moonraker style thing where, yeah, they're going to go off and colonize somewhere. Because what else? What, why is there a rocket there? I don't know. I don't. I have no idea why there's a rocket there. Um, uh, I mean, from it's kind of cool. But where's it going? Well, I think on orbit 48, it's going to eject the kid. And on orbit two, it's going to kick out to number two. And and I don't know what on and you notice there was another one there the orbit with no number and they opened that mm. as the prisoner went by like that was for him so I, I but was that is that to protect but, him and take him on the ship or was that for eventual disposal purposes which make no per sense whatsoever because it's kind of expensive to dispose of people by sending them up in a rocket but I I I don't know I can we, can we get so something what would they from, have been orbiting. Can we get something by... I, nah, nah. Who knows? I mean, the rocket itself was an ICBM, so I think that was ICBM? a British Blue Streak uh, intercontinental ballistic missile. When they when they actually show it taking off, that's that's uh -huh. actually a weapons rocket. But uh, British, uh, when when you guys were trying to get into the get into the world destruction game like we are, um, <laughs> yeah, that just that wasn't me. Just to be clear, but yeah, yeah. okay, y'all, uh, y'all, sort of the royal. You're part of that society. Uh, conformity yeah. and uh, all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah, my, it's my this is my burden. Is there, um, is, is there? Do we learn anything from what happens to them after the three people leave the village? Um, number two goes back to his old life, so well, his yes, rebellion and, is well, over. Um, w one of the things you alluded to was he doesn't have to cross the water. Yeah. Now that's interesting because in many happy returns doesn't doesn't he. I can't remember the exact geography of it, but doesn't he search for the village within a certain radius of somewhere around uh, Gibraltar or something? Yeah, like I think that? so. It's, you know, Mediterranean, Mediterranean, Africa, kind of. Um, so to drive, well, to drive from there to London without crossing the water is interesting. Also, in many happy returns, he left on a raft because it turned out the village was surrounded by mountains, which presumably have gone mm -hmm. if he can now drive a lorry straight out of the village. Tunnel? And Maybe and, that was the tunnel they were driving through at the... <laughs> yeah, but that looked like it came out in the village still. But yeah, I guess, okay, that's a possible explanation. And then they come out and they're, they're driving on the left. Now, I can't remember... I've never been to Gibraltar. It's a bit of a crazy place, so maybe they do drive on the left there. Um, but it, it, it just did kind of look like Britain. put all that together. It looked like he kind of came out in Wales or England. Maybe, maybe wherever you go, there you are. That's the kind of yeah. profoundity of that. Yeah. Or, or, you know, it felt like he was driving off, driving off the lot, <laughs> off the film set and, uh, 
the, you know, the rap party continues. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So the Dem Bones, Dem Bones singing seemed to cause great consternation in society. Is that, is that religion? Is religion upset the structure or is it, uh, or is it the power of music? Is, um, what was with the jukeboxes? Were the jukeboxes telling us something about the, the power of music to pacify the masses? I, I feel like there's something there too, but I can't, I can't get a grasp on it. That's how I feel about the show. I feel like they put something in front of me and like, here you go. I just can't pluck it out. And uh, to me, ultimately, either I'm stupid or it's a failure on the writer's part. And I'm going to go with failure on the writer's part just because. Better people than I have tried to figure out the prisoner. And, and I don't think they've succeeded either. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm not sure the music, the music as a revolutionary act seemed to be part of it to me. Though, obviously, you know, that does raise questions about their security because the, the guy starts uh, having a bit of a sing song and suddenly everyone's in chaos and they can't control him. So, but yeah, I don't know how that links with the jukeboxes. So, or, or um, if it, yeah, or if it links with the jukeboxes. I don't know. Um, so the people who were up in the gallery, I just made a note of every one of them I could find, uh, every section. Oh, okay. There was Good welfare, fact. activists, pacifists, identification, defectors, information, education. What do I want? Information. <laughs> Therapy, reactionists, nationalists, youngsters, recreation, entertainment, and anarchists. And there were others that I couldn't get, um, placards that I couldn't see, but I, I, Tried my best to get all of them off the list. Facets of, facets of the society, facets of, of, but some of them like therapy. Are they methods of? I took them, I, I, I took them, uh, you know, as sort of in show or in, in world explanation being that they were departments in it, in effect. They were, because it was, because it was a sort of council or assembly that they were representatives of each of those departments, though you'd have to assume that a department called pacifists or anarchists was a department that was actually about looking after or, or controlling those people. Um, so I don't, I don't know whether it stands up. I didn't, I didn't read your full list. I, I saw, um, a couple of them. Mm -hmm. I identity that was one that, that uh, stuck out or identification um but but yes uh, i mean in a sense it it would it would it would make more sense what you say that they that they are kind of representatives of sectors of society <clears throat> rather than something more functional than that let's see so now, uh, the number 48, he's, uh, he's going crazy. He's singing the song. They're dancing around. It's, uh, it's was, making was everyone. That his, I, I forget whether that was his number in Living in Harmony. I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. I guess we should look that up. Cause that's, that's his hat from Living in Harmony, isn't it? I think so, but it's not his outfit. Oh, by the way, that no. outfit. Okay. That is the outfit I was talking about when, uh, on one of our previous Doctor Who episodes, I said that when I look at a early 1970s, late 1960s British show, and you get something like John Pertwee's costume, I actually reasonably believe that somebody in Britain could go down to a store and buy that in that time period because of this stereotype. That is the, the British, I don't even know what classification of 60s counterculture style, but that shows up in, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure there must be one in Dracula 80, 72 when they got the, the kids and, and just, it's not a look that we ever had here to my knowledge, but you see it in British shows. And so I look at that and I go, yeah, I mean, it's weird. It's, it's feels out of time, but I, obviously there were stores that sold them somewhere. So I can believe that Pertwee could pull that out of somebody's locker and go, whoa, look at that. I found this outfit, but um, that's a, that's just an aside I throw out. But anyway, uh, number 48 is out of control until number six. I probably shouldn't call him number six, but I'm not going to call him sir. Um, 
until number six calls him young man. Term of respect? Is that what we're supposed to get out of it? It's like, you just need to give these people a little respect. Doesn't seem a very respectful term to me, but... Compared to 48? Maybe. Uh, it's still a label. <clears throat> well, so is Sir. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah, everything's a label. I don't know. It seems like that was what they were getting at, but I, I, don't know, I don't know. So, so let's look at number two uh, a little bit. We already mentioned that he, oh, yes. he was um, obviously a man of influence who came over to the ways. But, but what is revealed here is that he w- too was abducted and taken to the village, and he cracked, unlike number six. So not. Not a place for spies, necessarily. Um, people are brought here because they could be useful. What, why are you saying not not for spies? You think he wasn't a spy? No, I didn't think he was a spy. I thought he was like a, a political power broker. Because he gets taken back to Parliament. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and the yeah, way he said it, too, you know, whisper it in ear here. You know, that, that sounds like, um, um, can't think of his name. Um, you know, the, the guy in the thick of it. Um... Malcolm Tucker. Malcolm Tucker, yeah. He seems like he seems like one of those. Maybe maybe not quite as foul mouthed, but you know, somebody who's got to, who's got power but isn't visibly the, the power. Um, he's um he's also made over as a new man in in this um yeah, Oh yes. Now there were a couple of interesting things about that. One of which was it's the first time I've ever seen a Dalek shave someone. And man, that must be a big Dalek. <laughs> Because the size of that plunger. The other, the other question I had was, I didn't have, I, I didn't have, on your suggestion, I waited until the last minute to watch this. So I would be fresh to make this recording <clears throat> with my recent impressions. I haven't had time to look up whether this was the last episode produced. Yes. And whether the previous episode was the penultimate episode produced. No. No. They were months apart. Um, right. Because, Leo McCann looks really different. I mean, ob- obviously he's been shorn a bit, but his hair looks a different colour as well. Um, I think so. So was all that was all that to avoid a continuity problem? Yep, yep. It was entirely to avoid the continuity problem. He had shaven, and uh, uh, for some play he was in or some production, uh, had the different hairstyle, and they just had to work around it. If you if you'll note when they're hauling the body out, that clearly isn't McCarran. They're they're obscuring it as they carry him. Uh, the only angles you ever get are not him until the moment when they have the shaving cream all over his face. That's the first time you actually see his face in this episode. Right. So it's a clever bit of filming. I hadn't really thought about it until I. Of course, I knew he was renewed as a different looking guy in this episode, so I was watching a little more carefully when I when I went through it this time. But um, yeah, that was just a continuity thing. They they had shot fall. Uh, uh, I can't think of his name. Once upon a time, uh, sixth episode, so quite oh, okay. some ways back. Quite wow. some ways back. The other thing that occurred to me in terms of uh, timing um, was the 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 whole James Bond lair feel to it. Did you get that? Mm-hmm. That that um, you know has plagued James Bond films from You Only Live Twice onwards, pretty much. This whole concept of having an underground lair, i.e., studio, um, full of men in multicolored boiler suits running around with guns, um, and and uh, so I think You Only Live Twice was sixty-seven. Yes. Would it have been? Would it have been released before this was filmed or not? Presumably it can't have been. It's just a coincidence, or maybe they both have a, a common inspiration. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty hard to believe that the that the uh, helmeted sort of look for the, the guards wasn't uh, taken from a Bond film. And we didn't have that before, Hen? We didn't have helmeted guards before You Only Live Twice? Thunderball? Well, no? they, they, Thunderb- no, Thunder- Thunderball, they're all we- wearing different coloured uh, wetsuits. So in a way, that that does the same kind of thing. But you don't have the same you don't have the same underground lair thing, which you know seemed to become a bit of a, a bit of a thing. It's redress of the girl who was death sets. Ah, that was the episode that was shot immediately prior to this. Right. 
And in fact, when they started show, filming it, that's when McGowan told the crew this was the last episode, too. They didn't bother to tell him up to that point. What, you mean... But they'd already, they knew it was the 17th episode, so they wouldn't have known it was the going, last going to finish the series. They, they thought there would have been more than 17 episodes. Apparently so. That must have been an interesting one. They, I think that probably must have ca- cast a pall on the actual rap party. <laughs> probably much less jolly than what we, what we saw. Maybe my imagining is uh, not totally justified. You have, you have to think that there's probably a group of people who got on really well with McGowan that probably had a rap party. And then there was probably a group of people who hated that man's guts and wouldn't have anything to do with him. Um, just based on what we've, learned throughout the course of the series um there's an anecdote that the sequence where he jumps over the rail with the fire extinguisher and jumps into the robed men he wanted it done a certain way his stuntmen said you don't want to do it that way uh and mcgoohan being mcgoohan said no i want it done that way so the stuntmen did it and the stuntman was hurt and the three people he jumped into were hurt and there were some hard feelings there. Uh, but apparently afterwards that day, McGowan had the pub and a bottle of whiskey each for the guys. Uh, he got made amends. So he, he liked to get his way. And there were apparently from time to time people who were not happy with him. So I, I think it's reasonable to assume that probably he was a polarizing uh, figure. Yeah, yeah, certainly sounds like. So what about his encounter with number one? Well... Yes. Number number one, the way number one was set up, um, you know, with the kind of, with the eye and, and the fact we were supposed to, to believe that number two or the old number two never actually met him. The, well, the way, because the, the, the judge appeared to be able to communicate with him. Yeah. Um, in much the same way Harry Corbett used to communicate with Sooty, or was it Sweep? Not not an illusion I'm uh, familiar with. Yeah, he didn't get that. You know, the the um, puppets, and they would whisper in his ear, and he would say, you did what, Sooty, or whatever. So you'd hear one side of the conversation. And it, and it's, and it struck me as it had that kind of children's program vibe of this uh, sort of mm-hmm. model with an eye squeaking out messages that uh, the judge was listening to and saying, Oh, really? Oh, well, all right then, or whatever. So we kind of hear, hear that one side of the conversation. We have to infer everything else from it. Um, that seemed to me not the strongest, um, not the strongest aspect of the, the episode. Um, and as I say, when we actually see number one and his mask is pulled off. Both his masks. I didn't, both his masks, indeed. I, you know, I didn't quite get that that was actually McGowan there because it was too brief. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't quite know what to make of that. I, you know, are we pulling aside the mask is civilization, and underneath it we're an animal, and 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 you pull that back and reveal that we're looking at ourselves? I, I don't know. I I really, I'm <clears throat> I'm sure that this has been wrestled with for a while. Um, I have perhaps some answer on it uh, for later on, but I, I wanted to. I wanted to exhaust all our discussion before I pull up about the only thing Patrick McGowan's ever said about this, and I have it. We'll, I'll, I'll read the quote back uh, later on what he had to say about the episode. But um, yeah, it made... you can probably consider me exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't have any uh, searing insight onto what what exactly that might mean um there doesn't seem to be any in-world explanation it 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 seems to me one of the aspects of the show that has to be purely symbolic um i suppose it ties in with the prisoner of his own mind uh notion there are a couple of lines that were cut and i'll put them out one of which was when number two spits in the eye there's a line cut out where he says before that um and it kind of makes sense that it's in what it should have been in there He says, number one doesn't like it. He gets annoyed when you study him. And working on the, working on the idea that it's yourself, sometimes self-reflection is uncomfortable Mm -hmm. in people. So I can kind of see how that line leads to in keeping with, it it really is, it it really is himself. I mean, it, it obviously surrealistically weird, but, 
number one really is ultimately the person that keeps us in prison is ourselves. And oh, I go with that. Um, let's see, do I have anything else? We had um, a couple other things that were cut out. You, you may have noticed the scene where all the people on the mopeds in the scuba gear were escaping from the uh, lair. Mm-hmm. They had had a scene earlier uh, at the beginning of the episode that got cut where uh, when the supervisor was taking McGowan and the butler into the uh, the chamber, there was a place between the jukeboxes and the entry to the chamber where there was a, a red, yellow, and green light with go, slow, and stop written on it. And there was some, and I read the script section two times and I still can't figure out what they were going for, but it involved when the light was on go, then there was a steady stream of traffic of these people going and then it would go slow and you could go, but then it would, when they hit stop, then they would all drive around madly in circles and things. And McGowan had to, they had to get through that to get to the chamber. And and for some reason they're supposed to be in scuba gear on mopeds and things. I, I, it wasn't it wasn't very clear on on paper either. But they did end up being shown later on because they had already shot this stuff. And and everybody loves a good mopeded moped riding scuba diver in your cave. I, I suppose. Okay. Well, then let's let's turn to McGowan himself. Um, looking in the uh, the prisoner. Uh, original scripts book by Robert Faircloth or edited by Robert Faircloth volume two, which I previously mentioned is, is goes for thousands on Amazon. And I do have a beautiful matching set, uh, in almost perfect condition. And I will sell for $5,000 for the pair. Just get in contact with me. Um, at this point, uh, I love these books. I really do. They have like a couple of scripts that weren't made and I said, I love them, but for $5,000, I would see the back of them. And uh, we will convert. Yeah, if you want to pay in pounds sterling or, or whatever, euros, I'll take it. It's fine. Um, in the book, in, in discussing the, the um, this final episode, they uh, they mentioned an interview that McGowan did in 1979. And he talked about the Freudian psychological theories and awareness and all those things. But he, he wanted to point out with the... Uh, that basically you're trapped in a circle and what happens when you, how to get out of that circle. And, and here's what he had to say. He starts shooting guns. This was always part of the original conception. I'd been aiming for it since the beginning. In fact, around the world today, we have constant strifes. And sometimes in the course of history, you will find in a buildup of these frustrations, it comes to a conflict area where a war can clear the air. This constantly happens throughout history. If you go back to the beginning of time, Greece, Rome, Napoleon, the First World War, the Second World War, and eventually the Third World War, there is a conflict building up now worldwide. Israel, Egypt, Dublin, Ireland, England, Idi Amin, it's building up like a volcano about to erupt. I am not a pessimist. I prefer to be a realistic optimist, hoping that it won't happen, but in every instance, there has to be a breaking point. That's the reason I used violence. Even though we hadn't done that sort of thing before, suddenly he's shooting everyone in sight with machine guns, after which they leave the place, and you've got these three guys dancing a jig and singing a song, the hip bones connected to the thigh bone, which, in a way, was a celebration of freedom after violence. Then he goes back to his little house, it should never have finished with the two words, the end. It should have finished with the two words, the beginning. Because no one is a free man. No man is an island. The whole point of the prisoner, which the last episode made clear, is that each man is a prisoner unto himself. Number one, who some people thought was going to be some James Bond character with a bald head and gold teeth or whatever, was actually man's biggest enemy himself and that is what one is constantly fighting each day the biggest enemy we have is ourselves that's the prisoner is that what you have take would have taken out of this it's not it's not necessarily what would immediately have occurred to me if they held that shot on on number one a moment longer so i had actually been rather than suspecting it was uh, the man himself i had actually been certain of it that might have uh, that might have colored my impressions of it i guess it makes some sort of sense 
I, I don't I think guess it, it does. <clears throat> I mean, the village, the village is a construction. It represents society only then in so much as it represents his own perception of society. But that would be that would be uh, enough of a constriction, hmm. I suppose. I, I, you know, the one thing I do completely agree with um, in McGowan there is the the part about the guns. I mean, there, there have been the occasional gun in the prisoner over the years, but by and large, they're not used in the context of the village. Like, uh, we're going to have a gun in uh, Chimes of Big Ben, I think, uh, somebody shooting at them. Um, but on the outside world, we, we did see one with um, the schizoid man, but I think it was a special gun, wasn't it? Not a, not a killing gun, but a trank gun or something like that. But by and large, the, 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 the imposition of order was done through societal pressures, technological pressures, uh, rover uh, as, as the threat, but not through what is kind of the, the, the norm of the world in a way is that it's held in check by arms. Um, yeah, to some degree. I, and I the fact it's, it's interesting because I I tweeted a link. Um, a librarian friend friend of mine um, mentioned a project uh, where they were using iPads and what were described as rovers, which obviously actually meant librarians, but immediately made me think of the prisoner. So I tweeted her a link to a little YouTube clip of Rover from the arrival with that that kind of screeching sound. And and her response was quite interesting because she said, I, I don't want to watch that. I can cope with gory stuff, but I don't like psychological violence. Hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I, I take the point. Guns aren't used in the village in the way that they are used in Fallout, in the sense of blazing away and, you know, sort of in, indiscriminate shooting and death. But there is a real sense of violence underlying everything. And sometimes there are violent deaths caused mm -hmm. by Rover, but in a very, very uh, controlled way. And I think maybe what McGowan is alluding to there is something to do with the, the kind of um, the way in which violence breaks out of a very pressurized or, or a tinderbox situation, whether that's, you know, the violence you expect in writing 1979, um, it doesn't mention it, but there's obviously the Cold War at, at, at that point, and that is perhaps the biggest, bigger, you know, bigger We mentioned World War Three, Ireland or Edie, I mean, we, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe that's where World War Three would arise from, um, or, you know, World War One. Um, uh, in in you know, 1979, that kind of that's uh, in Europe. Yeah, in 1979, that's World War Three was always in, in the public mindset. That was that was the Cold that would War. that would have been the, the Cold War. Yeah, okay. Um, but but you know the, what the Cold War actually represents is a much. It's not that the the war isn't violent. It's it's very violent in its way, but it's controlled and kept in check by the balance of power being maintained. When the balance of power starts to shift, the risk is the violence spirals out of control. And that that's, I, I guess, kind of part of the whole um, Hobbesian justification for having a ruler that, w w you know, was being, being set up by the judge in this episode. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I, I, yeah, I think the pressure cooker notion, I think that's what we're, I think that's, I, I see that. I didn't see it at the time. Uh, I didn't see it until I read that quote. And I go, yeah, I, I, I can see this tipping point that we have as a species had time and time and time again, where people will continue under whatever form of societal oppression um, you know, you could take so much, but at some point, the cycle is only broken by people getting, it's very, it's very, um, negative attitude in the world, but it, uh, it, it has often been the case. But look at, uh, I mean, th this is making more and more sense the more I think about it. If you consider the way in which McGowan has portrayed the man throughout, you know, the previous 16 episodes of The Prisoner, it's all been about absolute control very very kind of the the most you'd ever get would be the the tiniest glimpse of 
the rage, the aggression boiling underneath. He would never let it get out of his grip. It would always be about control. But whenever, whenever he talked about the village, his goal was the total destruction of it, the, the kind of anger and uh, resentment and hate that he felt for the village and that, that whole organization always seemed to be the, the overriding emotion, particularly when he ever seemed to have left, left the place. So, you know, what, maybe in, in, in some way, what's satisfying about this episode is that you do get a complete destruction of the village. And in the process, or in order for that to happen, number six does basically completely lose control because he is, you know, randomly firing, firing machine guns at all of these bystanders, essentially. Yes, part of the, the village, um, the village structure, the, 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 the village, uh, society that has imprisoned him, but, but nevertheless, all individuals in their own way. And, and he has that moment of completely losing control. And then, as he alludes to afterwards, the, the, the euphoria of freedom. How does he put it in the, in the, um, quote you read? He said there was a celebration of freedom after violence. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, he, he, in, and it, in that, that celebration takes the expression of, again, a, a form of, um, not maybe not quite lost, but loosening of that self control. I mean, if we think about um, the w- there was certainly an episode where we, we there was a ball and we discussed dance the fact the that dead. he refused to d- dance of the dead. Uh, there you go, it's in the title. He refused to dance, and yet here he is happily linking arms with uh, number two or whatever we should call him now, and uh, you know dancing away in in a very wild and abandoned manner so that th- there is there is something there in the in the in the kind of um the the control is gone and there is this huge act of of destruction um okay i'm having i'm <laughs> the symbolism the symbolism of this seems to me to be inescapable and when i listen to this back on the podcast i'm going to regret it but there is also another act here that has to do with loss of control mm-hmm. and um a, and uh i wouldn't say quite dancing a jig afterwards but the fact that there's a rocket fired in the middle of it i see i see what you're going for you, and you, we have yeah, mentioned well, freudian yeah so um yeah. i i can't i having thought of it now this is the problem with the prisoner isn't it i can't i can't escape um drawing drawing the evidence uh, together around that um, that conclusion. Well, now you know um, why the rocket was in there. Mm, yes, that does make uh, some more sense to me now. A, a symbol of power and uh, uh, going off, and um, yeah, I you know I'm gonna I am gonna look that one up after this. Uh, I hope it's not just podcast me. podcast <laughs> and and see if anyone else has ever come up with the the theory of. Uh, phallic symbolism in the final episode of the prisoner so the um the, the fallout is actually post-coital <laughs> well i don't know it's been 47 years or, or whatever someone must have done in that time i'm sure i'm absolutely sure somebody has come up with that before um any uh any thoughts uh the takeaway you want to give on the series as a whole, having now completed the journey? I did wonder before I, before I started watching anyone who follows me on uh, Twitter will have noticed that I did ask myself whether this would change my perception of the show, partly because I wondered whether we would get certain answers. And I did wonder, you know, through every, every discussion that we've had previously, when I was kind of blundering around going, oh, yeah, maybe this means that, maybe this means that, whether you were sort of sniggering behind your hand because you knew all the way through who number one was. or Okay, I want, you to, I want you to make sure that when you listen to the podcast for Once Upon a Time, I know I threw at least two things in the conversation that were alluding to this episode in, in casual, and I was having a snicker about it at the time. Uh, so I, yes, that, I mean that doesn't surprise me. But having having said that, there were not um, 
there were not these kind of big, clearly drawn answers to it. Um, the other, the, you know, the other kind of risk with uh, final episodes is that they can be so they 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 can they can feed you things or um, give you ideas about the show that are just so um, disappointing. I suppose that they colour all the previous episodes. Again, Life on think... Mars, yeah, good example. Or Ashes um, to Ashes, one of the both. But anyway, <laughs> well, I think Life in, Life on Mars in particular for me because I really didn't like the ending to that. But you, that's that's the idea. You get an ending to a show where you know it's a, and and the whole premise of the show in Life on Mars. You know, is he is he dead? Is he mad? Or is he back in time? And you get an answer. And so whenever the question is asked when you rewatch the episodes, which frankly I haven't bothered to do, um, it, you know the answer to that question. So it's kind of like, mm, so what? So there, there was a risk of that. I think even if you didn't like this episode and it sounded like you weren't a big fan of it, Not it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have spoiled the rest of the show for you. Or it wouldn't have colored your view of the rest of the show. It it has it has absolutely colored the view um, of the show over really? the years. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I I I noticed it when I was watching the episode uh, when we were discussing it, uh, and you know, watching the episodes long, and as we would go in to discuss it, there were times when I would um, allude to his this this conformity of society uh, over and over again, and you would occasionally make a comment that you hadn't gotten that out of the episode, and Looking at it, trying to break it apart, you go, you know, maybe not. I think it is this last episode. Knowing where it was going, I had this feeling that he was be true to yourself. Be those concepts come back in episodes. I do see it in them. I don't know if it was there the first time through, but I think okay, I, I am but colored. Ha, ha, I, I mean, obviously, you there, there would have to be on some level, even if it's totally subconscious, some influence over your interpretation of the episodes. But has it changed your level of enjoyment? No, of the the rest of the show. No, I enjoy the other episodes for what they are. They are mostly nicely standalone. You know, the few that I don't really like, like Dance of the Dead or um, uh, Free for All uh, or, or Fallout, <laughs> for that matter. Um, are the exceptions to the rule. Okay. The, the but... game is, the game that we play through the episode wins for me as opposed to the overall goal. Yes. But obviously Fallout is significant because, because of its status as the, as the kind of the end, as it were, the answer, um, or the space where the answer should be. Mm -hmm. Um, personally, my, my view of the episode is I, I, I like it. I really enjoyed it, um, partly because, you know, watching it with this concept, they'd filmed the rap party. <laughs> that it's they're they're very uh, charismatic actors. The music it is it, it gives it an energy. It's a real it's a real sort of high energy episode. It does leave up to this kind of and you know what I'm thinking now, but climactic finale. Um, of you know everything, uh, God, going, going off. off. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't resist it. Um, but but you know, and 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 this and this kind of um, th th that that whole thing feels very satisfying. Um, as the, as they're all sort of driving down the motorway and celebrating, and everyone's going home, and everyone's happy, and then you just get this little this little hint. Um, with the door closing, but overall the, the, the kind of tone and feeling of the episode is quite celebratory. So, so it, it's, it's a kind of high energy episode with a lot of celebration in it. And, um, the, the, the only sort of, the only quibble would be, well, it doesn't make much sense. And, um, I guess the question is, how important is that? Because to me, I, 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 I still enjoy the episode. Even though you can ask me a load of questions, what does this mean? What does that mean? And I will have mm -hmm. to answer quite honestly. Mm, not quite sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that for a show that is all about questions, which it has been, mm -hmm. you, you run the risk of being less than satisfying if you don't answer them. From, I mean, it's not just like every question has to be answered. 
I'm not, I'm not going to go so far as to say that, but, but when the questions are very, very germane to the plot and you don't get them at the end or, or you don't get ones that make sense, I can understand why they had a lot of calls, angry calls to the ATV. I, I wouldn't have called, but the first time I watched the episode, I just kind of sat there and like, you would, what you the heck called. did I just watch? you got to remember there's no Twitter in 1967. Yeah. What, 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 what did I just watch? <clears throat> and um, so uh, I, it's not the most successful end episode, but at the same time, you're right. It does end on a high note. They are celebrating. It isn't a downer like Life on Mars. And... Um, it just it, it it ends, but it really feels like a bit of a a bit of a cop out. I mean, even to the point where they can just drive off to England, it's like you know we're just taking shortcuts here to get to the end of the story now. And and then the story itself, the the pieces as we watch it individually are just kind of loosely strung together, and so it it, it doesn't command my attention. Uh, like a better structured narrative story would. So, I mean, th- th- those are the reasons I'm not crazy about Fallout, really. But, but it does end the series, um, and it does leave you at least on a positive note that even if he is still a prisoner, at least he's a happy prisoner now <laughs> in a bigger prison. So, as a, as a whole, then the series uh, does it deserve its status as the the, the cult? series that it is purported to be yes no question really no question uh not ev- not every episode is a is an absolute classic and obviously it's it's only 17 episodes long it's it's quite short but um so inventive and really yeah i mean i i, I can see myself uh re-watching those episodes and and asking new questions of each one and 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 getting something new every time and that that kind of central performance by magoo obviously there's some great there's some great guest performances in there but mcguin is so central to this and he's so terrific in it um you know as an actor obviously he played a a big role behind the scenes as well but as an actor it's really a wonderful performance uh the, yeah the whole thing um it looks great yeah the, the 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 locations and the fact that I suppose that was slight disappointment in this there wasn't enough um port marion in it but uh, but uh, obviously we did get we did get a bit and that was that was nice um but yeah i mean that that i mentioned that because it it obviously is part of what people remember about the show and i can see why it's incredibly distinctive um so yeah no uh definitely a classic so now you have to watch the uh remake with uh ian mckellen but do i yeah i i've or, never watched it nope you haven't no i refuse so it might be brilliant it, it it might be but i'd say the odds are probably statistically well stacked against it yeah i don't think i heard anything good about it after it aired but um it, i think it failed to capture the prisoner ha huh, ha huh. um Anyway. But you but you know, what I did discover, because you know, we've been saying this is the end, what I did discover and I didn't know until this week was that Patrick McGowan returned to the role of number six. Did you know this? No. Season twelve of The Simpsons. Oh okay, I think I did. I haven't use... seen it, but um I think I'm gonna have to watch it now because obviously this this viewing isn't complete. Season six of The Simpsons. We'll I'll have to track season, that down. Season twelve. Did 12. I say six? I, I don't know. 12. Six, six, twelve. Six of one, half dozen <laughs> of the other. What do you want? I know. I know what you're doing there. No, that would have been nice, wouldn't it? Um, but yeah, no. Well, season twelve is two sixes. Is, uh, maybe they can, well, they're not going to get him back for season thirty-six. Um, hmm. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining me on this journey through the village. Well, it's been a pleasure. I'm only sorry <laughs> there won't be a next time. And uh, I'm sure we'll come up with something else to uh, to uh, gab on about. Well, I look forward to that. As long as it's not Man from Atlantis. And, and listeners, uh, I hope you'll join us all again next time on Fusion Patrol. We hope you've enjoyed this retro episode of the Fusion Patrol podcast here at the Fusion Patrol Classics YouTube channel. For new episodes of our audio podcast every week and our entire back catalog, come visit us at FusionPatrol.com 
or subscribe in iTunes or most anywhere fine or even disreputable podcasts are found. You can also support our podcast at patreon.com slash fusion patrol.